There's now a third definition that we need to get into, which is called the Lewis definition. And this is the one that we're not going to talk a whole lot about. We're going to mention it here just to introduce you to the idea. And there's a couple of different species uh, whose acidity can be explained by the Lewis definition. So it's important in that sense. But most of our work is going to center on the brossard lowry definition. The beauty of the Lewis definition is that it's not limited to reaction that contains proton or OH minus. It actually takes it beyond that and uses the more fundamental particle, which is electron, to define acids and bases. This allows us to expand the concepts of acids and bases to gases and solids, so things that don't contain water. So it goes beyond just aqueous solutions. So a Lewis acid is just a species that can accept electrons. A Lewis base is a species that can donate electron pair. So very, very general definition. So now if I have a reaction where both of the reactants are gases, I can still have an acid-base reaction based on the Lewis definition. So the general look of it would be something like this, where A is an acid and B is a base. You can see that B and A can react together forming what we call an adda or an addition product. And it's just the acid and the base bonding together. So it's the electron pair that's on the base there that is being donated to form a bond between the base and the acid. So this new compound we call a coordination compound. The bond itself is often called a coordinate covalent bond because it is a covalent bond between the base and the acid because the electrons are being shared. Now, the Lewis base is any species that has a lone pair electrons that it can share. Could either be just a species that's negatively charged like an anion or it could be something like oxygen and water that has some lone pair electrons. The Lewis acid on the other hand are species that have some empty orbitals that can pull in or host that electron pairs that's being given by the base. So anybody with an incomplete valence shell could act in theory as Lewis acids, right? Anybody that has that free or empty orbital, because when the Lewis acid forms that coordinate covalent bond with the Lewis base, then you have an octet of both the acid and the base. So here's an example, NH3 with BF3. Now there's no water there. So you just have NH3 with BF3. And the N here has that lone pair of electrons. The B here has a lack of octet. So it needs that electron to satisfy itself to make it octet. So then it forms this adda, which then has a bond between the N and the B. And now everybody has octet, so both that resulting compound is more stable. You have to figure out which species is accepting electrons and which species is donating electrons to determine a Lewis acid and Lewis base. In this particular reaction, you're going to need to draw the Lewis structure. This particular Lewis structure looks like this. You have the C2H5, and you have the C2H5, and then you have two lone pairs on the oxygen. And the aluminum chloride looks like this. And it's the aluminum here that needs that bond, right? Because again, that doesn't have octet. Aluminum could exist on its own that way, but it will be more stable if it could form the octet. So then it's the attraction between the electron on the oxygen with the aluminum here and the formation of that new bond that creates the atom. Okay. So if you get the product here, it will look something like this. Okay, so if you write it that way, then it's pretty clear that the aluminum is the Lewis acid because it's accepting electron. And then the ether compound, which is this guy right here, that's your Lewis base because it's giving away or donating electron to make that bond. The main importance of the idea of Lewis acid and base in this class is in understanding the formation of complex ions. We will have a later chapter where we will talk specifically about complex ions, but we'll kind of touch on it here and there. This is the first introduction to complex ions. These are just polyatomic ions that contain a central metal ion, and then you have other small molecules or ions that are attached to that metal ion in the center. A hydrated metal ion would be an example of a complex ion. So this is where you take metal ion and put them in water, for example, an aluminum chloride in water. It actually forms this complex right here. So what happens is the aluminum chloride dissociates into aluminum and chloride ions. The aluminum then reacts with water as a Lewis acid Lewis base reaction to form this atta, which is shown on the right. So this structure right here. So you can see that six of the water molecules surround the aluminum ion. The water molecule each donate the lone pair from the oxygen to form that coordinate covalent bond with the aluminum. The aluminum is positively charged. 
and that's why that reaction happened. So in fact, when you have water and aluminum together, you don't have them as separated ion like this aluminum, but it actually looks like this aluminum with six water molecules bonded together. So in Chem 11, we had sort of simplified situations by saying that, well, the aluminum ion exists on its own, but in reality, it's actually surrounded by the water molecule. And so that's what we call a hydrated metal ion. In this case, the aluminum is a Lewis acid because it's accepting electron and water acts as a Lewis base. Because of the positive charge in the aluminum ion, that has a really strong pull on the electrons. So that pulls the electrons between oxygen and hydrogen in the water so that that weakens that bond because more of the electron is pulled towards the oxygen because the aluminum is pulling on it and that weakens the bond. It's just easier to break that bond. And so in fact, see this reaction happen. Again, one of those bonds is weaker, right? Let's say this bond right here is weaker. So you have a lot of water present, right? Water is in the solution. So when the water comes along, it can attract that hydrogen, which has that weakened bond, to form a hydronium ion. And this is the remainder of the species after that hydronium ion is released. And so now, actually, this is a bronsted lowry reaction. In this case, this is a proton acceptor, and then this is a proton donor. And of course, proton donor is an acid. So now this is just a bronsted lowry acid, same as we talked about earlier. And proton acceptor is a base, so water is a bronsted lowry base. So now you can see how these small, highly charged cations can act as acids. One is aluminum ion as a Lewis acid when it was on its own here. And then once it becomes that hydrated metal ion, the aluminum ion acts as a bronsted lowry acid because there's another water that comes along that can accept that proton, thereby making the hydrated aluminum ion a bronsted lowry acid. The key finding, though, is that aluminum, when dissolved in water, is acidic. The take-home message here is that some of these small, highly charged cations can form the hydrated metal ion in the presence of water. And these small, highly charged cations usually come from the transition metal ions. So you will see this type of reaction happen with zinc, iron, nickel, aluminum, and some other transition metal ions.